粉煤灰。粉煤灰啊？粉煤灰是吗？还真不知道。是不是那种弄墙的那种啊？我手中这些灰黑色的就是粉煤灰，可以看到粉煤灰的表面已经覆盖了一层薄薄的沙土，但是这些沙土也不能有效地阻止粉煤灰被吹吹扬，因为它它们很容易被大风带走。防火灰是个就是那个灰呜呜一股，刮着就炸一片片。那伤口才是上边嘛，那后伤口也是堵是污染的，那些灰灭嘛。在我身边不远处可以看到。许多这样随意堆放的浅灰色的固体废弃物，这些都是从火电厂运来的粉煤灰。这样的粉煤灰在这里是没有任何任何的管理措施的，没有任何的覆盖。如果有大风的话，很容易就会被大风带到更远的区域。我们这儿几乎除了一夏天，哎，一呃两个月到三个月之间不刮风，几乎天没是刮风。但是这个一刮风，这个灰呢，它是见的谁像是，哎，从这儿刮到大通，大通再往太原，太原再往南刮，一直陆续向的刮。强调两点：第一点，这是煤矿，它分布就是分布在我们亚洲沙尘的途径上。它这些煤矿，它扬起来以后，跟原来的沙尘正好是混合在一起，一直在往前走。北京就是在沙尘暴传输途径当中去的。上海是我们近年才注意到，就有记录以来，沙尘暴。近几年我们在上海也看到很强烈的这种污染构成。而且是跟北方的沙尘在同一个时间，长途传输，又把煤矿的污染、煤灰的污染带过来。那么现在的这种传输啊，就不仅传到北京、上海，而且传到我国的宝岛台湾，传到广州，传到香港，甚至传到我们南海上面也是岛上去。所以这种污染呢、啊，是大面积的，是不是仅仅是一个地方呢？沙尘暴的发生的时候呢？主要的特点是它那个大气里边颗粒物浓度急剧的增加，汞、镉、铅，这都是煤炭的一些成分。从我们的研究显示呢，就是，呃，它的主要的急性效应还是对这个暴露人群，特别是一些呃儿童啊、老年人这些敏感人群呢，它还主要显示的一些呼吸道症状比较明显，呃，呼吸道的一些炎症，急性气管炎啊。嗯，什么鼻炎啊、咽炎啊、呼吸道的症状，呼吸困难啊、咳嗽啊、气喘啊，啊，这样一些症状，它的发生率、啊、都要明显的增加，一般都要增加一到两倍了。有啥子毛病，家家里面不带都不出门了吧？你知道吗？这些的危害肯定会有影响，呼吸啊什么的肯定会比平时要难受一些。因为我父亲是肺病，他的肺病是。没有查出什么原因得的，然后医生给的结果就是他可能有由于空气污染。如果对环境带太的，应该放缓经济发展的速度，都有必要要先把以保护环境为主。粉煤灰的危害超出了我们生活在城市人当中的想象，我觉得有点地狱的感觉，就是在这个遮天蔽日的粉煤灰厂，所以我们。呼吁要运用新的能源，尽量采用新的能源，而不是这种比较呃很肮脏的呃传统的化石能源。If you haven't been to these places before, so I suggest you to watch some video like this. It feels like landing on the moon. So、um, I want to just. This is a chart showing you the relationship between life expectancy on the y-axis, and you have、uh, PM 2.5 levels on the x-axis. As you can see here, as PM 2.5 goes higher, life expectancy tends to go lower. Now, this is the chart to show you what is exactly in PM 2.5, PM 2.5 in, in China.、Uh, oops.、Uh, in China, 45% comes from the burning of coal, and that's a key reason why we have a lot of air pollution here in China. We also have a lot of、uh, uh, PM 2.5 coming from car emissions, transport emissions. This comes from two studies: one by Deutsche Bank, the other by Macquarie Bank. Now in Beijing,、um, last year, January 
January 13, 2013, was the most, the most famous air apocalypse event in Beijing, where air pollution levels, PM2.5 levels, reached 800. And just to give you some perspective, the safety level is 25. I was in Beijing when it hit 800. Uh, it, looked, it felt like you were sort of in a smoking lounge constantly. Now, in Beijing, uh, the most of the pollution actually comes from interregional, because in Beijing, we are surrounded by Hebei. And Hebei is a major center for steel, coal, uh, glass, cement, and so forth. This is the PN 2.5 levels for the from last year, two, January 2013, all the way to the first half of 2014. The green line shows you the daily fluctuations in PN 2.5 levels. The red line shows you the 30-day running average of those of the, the daily fluctuation. And the dotted line refers to the national standard. So you can see the green line is very rarely below the national standard of 35. Uh, this is more updated data to show you all the way to October of this year. Now it's important to recognize in China, it is not PN 2.5 which is important, it's AQI. AQI is the air quality index and the air quality index is a measurement of PN 2.5 and PN 10 and other air quality uh, measurements. The, so this is only for Beijing. And just recently, after the national holidays, we had another um, air apocalypse event. I just want to very quickly tell you that Beijing, China has an air pollution plan. We have an air pollution plan that is taking time to be impl implemented now. This air pollution plan was announced the last year in September, and the air pollution plan focused on the three main areas of the Jingjiji area, the Yangtze River Delta area, and the Pearl River Delta region. And it focused on three main things, coal consumption, industrial emissions, and the use of clean energy alternatives. This is a this is national plan announced last year. There was a regional plan that came out for each of the provinces. And then you have each of the provinces announce their own uh, provincial plans. Um, very quickly, I just want to say that these are the six main ways in which the Beijing government is trying to deal with air pollution in Beijing. But they vary from province to province. Um, this is the key reason why Beijing is so polluted. Beijing is located here and is surrounded by Hebei. And in Hebei alone, you have six of the most polluted cities in China. I'm going to skip ahead. In 2012, Hebei produced more steel than any other region on Earth. Hebei produces more steel than 27 countries of the EU combined, and more than twice that of the United States. Hebei alone, the province of Hebei, is twice the U.S. in terms of steel production. And if you know, 60% of Hebei's steel capacity is not even registered or illegal. And if, you, if, you don't have, if they don't have the necessary uh, or Tuoxiao or Dinox or Desox kind of equipment on those steel, power, steel, steel plants, then you get the, this kind of situation. Okay. Um, this is a very complex chart, but I just wanted to show you this because it's very important. You have all the provinces here on the left-hand side being grouped by, uh, by the region, Huabei, Dongbei, Huadong. The air pollution plan, what's really interesting about the air pollution plan is that it specifies a PN 2.5 drop, and it also specifies a capacity reduction. So China is actually realizing that to deal with the PN 2.5 situation, you cannot just say, oh, no more driving in the cars and so on. You actually really need to start to deal with the capacity, overcapacity issue in heavy industry in China. So as an environmentalist from Lisa Herping, this actually gives me much hope because I think China is actually addressing from the fundamental underlying reasons why we have massive air pollution in this country. Um, I am going to skip a lot of slides because people are getting tired and hungry. Um, I would be happy to talk to you about these things. 
Uh, in fact, next Tuesday, I will be giving a public presentation in Shanghai with more details about these things. Um, I would like, just like to show you one more video to show you uh, what's happening in the west of China. Okay? Um, just, just basically saying, I'm going to just stop this now. Um, basically, what's happening now is that air pollution is being addressed on the eastern side of China. But a lot of the air pollution is actually also becoming transferred to the west of China right now. And this is a video to show you. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I hope I didn't spoil your appetite and so on. This just shows to show you the man, many challenges that China faces here. Uh, I, I think you are all from, many of you are from the private sector. My only advice, I, I think, is to keep your eyes open and look beyond your own value chain and the big issues which are happening here in China. As I said in the panel earlier today, I think businesses, you actually have to think about, uh, you have to meet the basic legal requirements. But if you, have, you, have, if, you, if, you, if you are someone who aspires for a better world, you have to push your organizations to also push the government for greater regulatory change. So thank you for your time, and I'll hand it back to the mic. Okay. So does anybody have any questions for Calvin and or Peter? Okay, I um, don't want to take too much of your time, but uh, quick uh, one observation, another question. Observation on Calvin's presentation, thanks very much. Uh, but I think the video you put on, the two videos are very visually impactful. Uh, I think we all know how uh, those matters happen across China. The important thing for us is not only being moved by the video, but more to understand how Greenpeace can do, what Greenpeace do in order to stop that. So I hope we have a chance afterwards to discuss about that, other than just seeing the video. Uh, question to Peter. Uh, good presentation. I want to ask you, because I'm interested in the deforestation issue uh, that you mentioned about palm oil is the sector first affected by the incentive measures and uh, preferential uh, mechanism. How they are actually affected and how do you see the cope with the change towards more sustainable business? Uh, it, it's an interesting one. Sorry? Yeah. Um, why we chose the palm oil sector is, uh, I, I think, directly related because of the, uh, the Singapore uh, connection uh, and the direct 
effect that we feel um, in Singapore. We had the worst uh, haze. Uh, I think uh, uh, Calvin mentioned the 800. Uh, we had up into the 400s in Singapore, which was never, never for, for experience from the burn off um, in Indonesia for the palm oil sector. So this has been on our agenda for a while, and um, the it, uh, it it took quite time convincing, and again, it wasn't unanimous on the uh, the forum. Um, but the, the, the decision for net deforestation, uh, we think it's good business. We think that it's a, it's a good business practice. We think it's a, uh, and a good example to set. And it's, it's mandatory. So we have given a lead time of six years, which we think is sufficient for the palm oil sector to come to the party. And we don't think it's difficult. You know, for every uh, uh, acre of forest that they actually uh, uh, burn down or cut down to plant palm oil, uh, they have a moral responsibility to replace. And the, the, the simple fact is if they don't, um, they're going to find it very difficult to get lines of credit or they're going to find the cost of capital uh, incredibly expensive. Uh, and our colleagues in the insurance industry have also come to the fore and they're going to be uh, charging significantly more insurance premiums. So palm oil companies that don't uh, come to the party in line with this compact uh, will suffer competitively and they will ultimately um, uh, be out business. Their competitors that do prove net deforestation will, uh, will have more dominance in the market. So we, we see it as being a domino effect. Any other questions? Okay, if not, um, then I think we can just end it for today. Thanks, guys.